Seven and seven Vikings with about a coin flips chance to reach the postseason have three games remaining all against NFC North teams, two at home and then one in week 18. We shall see if that means anything. Usually Vikings games in the final week of the season don't mean anything, but this one has a has a decent chance to do so. The team lost. They coughed away a 17-3 lead on Saturday at Paycor Stadium. Lost the Bengals by three. So I'm going to start with Ron. Uh, I haven't talked to this group and Sally in particular for about a month. Uh, I want to know now, Ron, your overall feeling on the seven and seven Vikings, how much has changed in the past couple of weeks, if at all. I mean, it's hard because when you take that step back and look at it, like Jefferson missed a significant amount of time. They lost their quarterback. And I know a lot of teams around the league have lost their quarterbacks, but um, the fact that we're even in a position to at least control our own destiny and make the playoffs. Um, that's impressive in its own right, considering we've used four quarterbacks. Um, so when I look at it from that aspect, you know, I can at least enjoy these games. And then it's also, you know, we went out, the Lions, you know, with, with two of those games, and they play the Cowboys next week. Vikings can still keep my uh, running joke of that Tampa's won the division more recently than them, um, as long as Vikings take care of business and, the, you know, the, the Lions – lose out as well so um the games are extremely frustrating to watch sunday being one of them um again uh having a guy smaller than me push uh, <laughs> on a play and <laughs> stuff like that where again i'm a big kevin o'connell fan as a coach but maybe koc needs to just become khc and remove the oc from it so Yannick. oh <laughs> i got it <laughs> give me a second <laughs> Yannick, seven and seven. Uh, we had a long drive home from Cincinnati <laughs> this week, um, but we we found we'll find a little hopium along the way. What is your overall sentiment on the five hundred Vikings? Um, you you just never know what team you're gonna get. One day, uh, one week they are winning three nothing. Then they allow three touchdowns in the fourth quarter, and the next week, it's just it's it's frustrating, but. I mean, they have shown the ability to play against any team, to beat any team, to lose to any team. So it's any given Sunday for, for that Vikings team in specific. Um, yeah, Nick Mullins, he can fling it. He will make dumb decisions. We know that. Um, yeah, if he finds the right balance and Flores' defense can, back, can get back to the previous weeks, I think we still have a decent team but it's you just never know what what vikings team you're you're getting sally the vikings get the lions twice and the packers once two at home in the next three weeks and then if if indeed they they get into the postseason there's a decent chance they play the lions three times in 20 days we haven't talked to you in quite some time how are you feeling now that dobbs is on the bench and it's mullins how are you feeling about the team yeah, I'm really disappointed in the scheduling of this program, to be honest with you. I mean, my peak contributions, that like four week window yeah. just really didn't work out <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, you know, like we didn't have a show for a few weeks. Then I had like a Timberwolves game. And, and you know, uh, so we kind of missed that high point for me. <laughs> but um <sighs> it, it really feels crazy that we're talking about only having this many games left mm -hmm. it feels to me like i don't know the last two weeks have just been so surreal I haven't even really happened i don't know um i don't feel good about it uh what what's gonna what I, don't, I can't even find the words for how i feel about it apparently i just don't see anything exciting happening it's just been torture the past month or so just watching this team it's been agonizing so did you expect something different when the quarterback went down like like one of these three quarterbacks would be good good well i think it was quite the roller coaster right because kirk was playing so well and the team was looking so good and then when he goes down automatically your first thought is oh season's over mm -hmm. and then this whole josh dobbs st story happens and it just seems I mean, it was an out of this world, crazy success story there for a couple weeks. And you think, oh, wow, well, maybe this is destiny. This is the way we're used to making runs to NFC championship games is with, you know, unforeseen circumstances. And then that just really crashed and burned. Um, 
and I don't see any way now that they get that juju back. So personally, even if, even if they <laughs> they draw, let's say the Lions in the wild card round or the Eagles, are are you just going into the playoff weekend going, nah, who cares? No, of course not. Who cares? I feel like I'm the big Debbie Downer here, and I'm just saying everything you guys said. I'm just articulating it way more depressed, I guess. There's been a long few weeks in my house here alone. Um, I just don't – like with last year, okay, we knew um, with that team that they – we thought, okay, maybe they'll win a playoff game. Well, we all thought that they would win that yeah. playoff game, but we knew no, the no. defense was so bad that there wasn't a likely chance they were going to go much further than that. With this team, it's like it's just not even fun at this point anymore to to watch. Um, so I don't think even if they squeak in, I mean, who are they going to beat? But we'll see. Like the Lions are going to be the the stiffest competition they've had that a game a very meaningful game coming up. So it will be interesting to see what what team shows up and what coaching decisions are made. I've got uh, some odd faith in Nick Mullins the rest of the way. And I, I have my, my bold Why? prediction. Uh, because uh, he, he does what Dobbs can't. He he gets the ball up to wide receivers and he throws outside the numbers. And I think so long as you know what you're getting with a couple strange throws that are, you know, the gunslinger thing, uh, I think that the Vikings can exist like this and, you know, beat the Lions a couple times here in the next three or four weeks uh, because it's – I don't think that the Flores defense will always melt down to the tune of three touchdowns in a fourth quarter. And I trust Nick Mullins uh, enough to, to, to do the thing basically. And he's just kind of a, a kid brother to kid cousins who's or Kirk cousins, who's just a, a little wild. And yeah, I, I enjoy that streak. I enjoy that. He'll give his wide receivers a chance. Uh, so my bold prediction for the playoffs right now is that if the, the Rams and the Vikings both get in, I think both of them, will win to their wild card playoff round. Uh, I think the Rams are sneaky good. Oh, it's wow. just, yep. It's just because nobody thought their roster was that good coming into the season. Uh, I have a feeling that they're going to either play the lions, uh, you know, Stafford and that Detroit connection. And then Philadelphia flat out, like almost has said personally that they have locker room disharmony. I think the Vikings can beat the lions and I think that the Rams can beat the Eagles. So right now uh, that's my, my way too bold prediction is that both wild card teams from the NFC will score upsets. All right, that's well, the. Gen- I hope you're right. Yeah, and then 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 probably on our way to, uh, what Dallas or you know Philadelphia could still get that two seed. San Francisco 49ers are probably going to the Super Bowl, but yeah, I I, I have faith that we have that five game win streak, and I do believe that when Kevin O'Connell, I think he's shown us a couple times in games where they're up against the wall. They come out and they play. And the only thing that really prevented them from winning somewhat commandingly was a total defensive meltdown. So I trust the team's coaching staff to figure out not to allow that to happen again. Even you say defensive meltdown in the sense like Jake Browning was just like playing 500 in his backyard. Like the, mm-hmm. like there were plays that like the receivers made that like were underthrown balls that were just made by, you know, T that play by T Higgins was unreal. Like they make that catch and, throw it you know over the pylon um i mean so yes the defense did give up those points but Mm -hmm. i think well mullins and that stupid ass throw to the defensive (laughs) tackle like that type that type of stuff where you're it's gonna happen with a backup quarterback it just is but i feel like the offense isn't doing the defense any favors in a lot of those uh circumstances if you play fantasy football you'll probably know that t higgins hasn't been a crazy hot commodity this season but I was telling Yannick on the drive home from Cincinnati that that catch probably made him between 10 and $20 million because he'll be a free agent next year. And I think, well, I think he would have been paid either way. Well, I think he would, but this year was really depressing for him, like in terms of what he can be. And yeah, so he certainly would have been on the open market, but I think that catch and snare, whatever you want to call it uh, over the goal line alone showed general managers that all right, yeah, if you, if you make him the alpha, he can do it. Uh, All right, so Ty Chandler is the next topic, Ron. I'm going to ask you about this. So fans have clamored for this guy for about a month and a half once they realized that Madison was more eh, suitable for an RB2 job, and then it took an ankle injury for Madison for Chandler to get the RB1 baton. Wouldn't you know it? Was it 130, 130, 132 rushing yards, 23 carries, a touchdown? Do you think this is the moment in time where Chandler 
takes over the RB1 job henceforth, like this year or maybe next year? Or do you think it goes back to Madison? Um, it better be. Like, I think Chandler has proven, you know, over the course of the season that that electric ability that he has that Madison just doesn't have. Madison is, a, like you said, he's a solid RB2. He's great in pass protection. But, the, yeah, those roles need to be flipped. Like, you know, Madison could be the third down back because of his pass protection, because of his ability to well, catch the ball most of the time. Um, but Chandler has that element that Madison just doesn't, that, you know, the Dalvin Cook like nature of being able to make a guy miss, find the hole, and you know, make something out of nothing. So, um, you know, whatever reason KOC's stubbornness and sticking with Madison when he's preached ball security and players who keep making mistakes are, are going to be benched, but Madison it seemingly is the the exception where you know he makes a mistake, but yet the faith is put back in him. I don't understand that so um hopefully they start seeing what you know everyone that watches vikings game is seeing and that you go with the more the more electric option just as that threat and you know he proved it he went out and he you know put up over 125 yards um and a touchdown something that madison i don't think has ever done um Mm -mm. you know in his uh, vikings career so again not knocking madison i think he's a valuable second running back i think his time as the rb1 has passed yannick i know what you think about Chandler and Madison, but what do you predict? Do you think that this goes back to a 50-50 carry split, or does Chandler truly now get 20 carries per game? So I think it's going to be more 50-50. Um, not like... I don't think Chandler will take over as the lead back. Um, Kevin O'Connell just seems to be to be really fond of Alexander Madison in the backfield, and I don't know why. I mean, running game was a disaster in, what, 10, 11 of those 13 games with Madison. So I don't understand it, but I think it's going to be, it's going to continue to be a 50-50 split at best. Sally, 50-50 for Chandler and Madison, or does Chandler finally get like a a bump to 65% or so of the rushing attempts? No, I think Yannick is exactly (laughs) correct. And I think the fans have been saying this for way longer than a month and a half. I think we've been saying this since like week three (laughs) Um, or even earlier that we wanted to see him because of how fast he is. So, but no, I I thought that this was going to change a few weeks, maybe a month ago. Um, That first home games that Dobbs had where Chandler played really well at at home, I thought it was going to change back then and it, it went right back. So me, it, it's shades of uh, for those who follow the twins. It's shades of Nick Punto. He's getting playing time when he was never earning it. Like he didn't do anything other than maybe his hustle, his attitude. Uh, but he, so that's what the Madison situation reminds me of. It's why is he getting so much playing time? What does he? Ha- what information does he have on O'Connell um, that keeps him in the lineup? <laughs> that type of thing. Uh, I think that this is the the point where Chandler begins his takeover, so to speak, um, because first of all, he is older than Madison. So it's not like, you know, he's got this infinite amount of time, like the clock is ticking on Chandler. And Running I, back age, age doesn't matter, though. Years does. Yeah, so. yeah that's true. The uh, I just think it would be total malpractice if we go to the game or turn it on television Sunday and then boom, Madison's getting 24 carries and Chandler gets like seven. Like the, the, the proof was in the pudding. It, it It's not that hard to figure out. And I think, I think at the very worst, if you want to say it that way, that it'll, it'll be equitable where they both get, you know, 15 carries, but this is important for Chandler the next three weeks, hopefully, hopefully four weeks, because you got to figure out if he's the guy at RB one, because if he is not, and, you know, he looks like a turd in the next three games, then you are going to have to use high round star and then second, third, fourth round draft capital on a running back because we don't want to go through what we just went through in 2024 again. So I think that it started off, I know it started off wonderfully for Chandler. And it's a very important part of his career in these next three games to figure out, all right, do, can we cross this box off the offseason or do we need to go, you know, use that third rounder on a running back? The one other part of the the Chandler dynamic, um, Madison was always very good at coming in like as a backup and yeah. putting up numbers. Whereas, like whenever he was a starter, it was like the Tavares Jackson situation where, whatever reason, he just didn't perform. And Chandler was the opposite. This is his first time when everyone knew he was going to be the bell cow, and he showed out. Like usually, 
I mean, for me, at least that says like his preparation was there and, you know, everything getting up for the game, like having that extra juice. So um, I think that's a, a very anti Madison in that regard that he did what was expected. What I want. Yeah, I think we all felt that way wrong. Cause I, I mean, I, I, didn't we all say at the beginning of the season or when they let Dalvin go that we all thought this was a good idea. Yeah. I know I and said I think, it was a good idea. It was. And I think they yeah, the biggest question mark was the, that, and I think we even talked about with Bryant where that mindset of you are the number one guy. Now you have no competition. You don't have to go and, you know, prove yourself on a day in day out basis, but um, maybe there's something to that, but yeah, I think we, but I think we also as fans have realized that there was a flip at some point, maybe it was before oh, the Broncos yeah. game or whatever that, you know, Chandler is just showing more flashes of being, you know, more capable back. I'm not saying Madison should not be dressed and not be used in any which way, but the the role just needs to switch. And I think everyone got that memo except for O'Connell and hopefully he (laughs) finally gets it. Yeah. I was uh, bitching to Yannick the whole way to Cincinnati that why are the Vikings the only team that can't have a running back by committee? Why is this the first year we've tried it since 2005, 2006, and then it just doesn't work for us. So I think the problem is, you know, both both Ron Sal, you've nailed it, is that you probably from the beginning needed Chandler as the lion share guy, whether that's 18 carries or 25, and then have Cam Akers or have Madison do the mop-up duty. That might be the formula for the running back by committee, because I'm pretty sure they're going to use this committee thing for Kwesi Daffa Mintz's tenure. That's what, you know, analytics and Moneyball recommend, and you won't right. see the top dollars spent on running back. So I'm hoping that Cincinnati was, you know, planting your flag that, all right, this could work. We just can't force feed Alexander Madison, who has like a tight end speed over and over. It's weird, too, because so like you mentioned that, that this is the, you know, the quasi way of, you know, maybe the small ball type thing where we're going to find a late round running back. But, you know, from all accounts, I've heard the Vikings were in on David Montgomery. They were going to pay him. And then also another thing that I've heard is if Jameer Gibbs is available in the first round, they were going to take him. So while I agree, like I would never, unless it's a you know generational player, I would never spend high capital on a running back. But I'm firmly in the mold of every four years you should spend a second round pick on a running back because look at look at second round pick running backs. Usually they're just not good enough to go in the first round. But look at the Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker, you know all these guys that are you know elite producers. Like sucks for the position, but just recycle them every year. Second round yeah. pick, four years later, second round pick. Yeah, unless you have the opportunity to draft at a reasonable spot or in free agency, the only way you should be paying, you know, over ten million, whatever it's gonna be, the the top floor is for a top three guy, whether it's McCaffrey or Bijan. And even then it's debatable because all the teams that win Super Bowls, they just have a commit. Uh, the Patriots and LeGarrette Blunt can tell you all about it. All right, my next question is a little bit weird. I've never asked this, but it came to mind when I was thinking about the whiteout. Sally, I'm gonna start with you. If this is a lame question, you can just tell me which uniform event for the Vikings is the best or your favorite. Is it the whiteout uniforms, the color rush or primetime or they call them primetime purple? Can't remember if they're called color rush still. The throwbacks, which are beautiful, but they always lose Uh in them. Purple on purple or just don't care the usuals. Um, I think I like the purple on purple the best. I also and I do like the white on white. I really just like any time that they do something new, though. I think it's fun. I wish that the NFL would take more um, opportunities with that, like the NBA does. Yeah. Because they've there's so many cool jerseys and they would make so much more money. Um, Like the Timberwolves, I mean, all NBA teams, the Timberwolves specifically. I mean, I want like six jerseys this year. It's it's awesome. So I don't know if I have a specific favorite. I'm with you. I the. I do think the throwbacks were a little overhyped. I don't like them as much as I thought I would. Okay. Yeah, I completely and will 100% eternally agree on the NBA approach uh, because there's no harm. Uh, you know, the the I think the Warriors kind of got it off the ground during their dynasty. Like every night they had something cool that said, you know, Rip City and blah, blah, blah. Or wait, no, theirs was the, excuse me, that's Portland. It was, oh, what is the... What's the I little moniker? Wasn't there's the just the city? Was like it the city? Yeah, the city. Yeah, yeah, and they just had so yeah, so many different variations. So 
Uh, and then sometimes, you, you know, you'll see those articles on the internet or on Twitter of, you know, somebody posts a white helmet or a gold helmet, and then you have the boomers going, no, we can't switch to those. And I'm always like, homie, it's for a single game. They're not going to just get right. rid of your, your favorite uniform. This is to, you know, drive engagement and have fun and sell merchandise, which they should want to do. So if they could bust out a white helmet once per year or do the ugly mustard helmet, that would be so cool because it's a change of yeah. pace. I think the only drawback is that there's 17 games and the NBA can get away with it because there's 82. Uh, but I, I do like this whiteout thing. I couldn't attend last year's whiteout because we were snowed in here when uh, Joseph oh, hit yeah. the game winner. So this will be my first whiteout experience with this team. I love the throwbacks. I just, it's criminal that they squandered them with losses to the Buccaneers and uh, Bears. So I'd say Color Rush, that, when that came out, that was really cool. I think that was 2016. But those throwbacks yeah. are probably my favorite at the moment if they just started winning some damn games in them. I also feel like the throwbacks would have been cooler if Tampa Bay also would have worn their throwbacks. Yeah. Like, why, wasn't the, the why wasn't it the best? Why wasn't yeah, why wasn't it the creamsicles against the Vikings throw? It didn't make any sense. <laughs> I was thinking about uh, the when the Titans and Texans played this week. There was probably yeah. a lot of Houston-based fans that were watching that that were getting confused. Like, you know, <laughs> no joke, you know, especially if you're an old timer and you watch because, I mean, that was theirs. And that should have been like for the rights to wear those throwbacks because those Oilers ones are so precious. Like when the Lakers wore MPLS jerseys across the chest, <laughs> yeah. like, not yeah, only I, did you take our team from us, now you're rubbing it in our face. Yeah, I have the LeBron one <laughs> yeah. in full disclosure in my closet, the uh, the baby blue one. Uh, Yannick, nice your favorite time. Vikings uniform event. Um. I like the color rush jersey. I also like uh, the throwbacks. Um, I bought the, the Kirk Cousins throwback jersey. I think it's a disaster. They just lost these games they should have won against the Bears and the Buccaneers. But I like the jersey. I think they, I hope they're going to wear them more often and win a game. That's <laughs> yeah. the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. Another thing uh, we didn't mention in that lineup, Sally is for, for sale like four or five years ago, you could go buy those gold jerseys pretty easily, like on NFL.com or your favorite oh. jersey site. And because those weren't just like some graphic designers, like what, what like article on complex.com, like they were actual merchandise sold by the NFL. I thought, shit, they might actually wear these. Of course they did not, but that's another option. And those, you know, a lot of people will call those hideous because they're they're gold or yellow or whatever. But it's weird that the Vikings sold them and then just never never use yeah. them. I wish I wish Bryant was here to talk about those hideous Reebok jerseys of his era. <laughs> you know what with I mean? The with white the white collar and the white stripe down it, the, yeah. with the piping. Yeah, the worst and the the color purple on it was like the worst color purple ever. So like the Adrian yeah. jerseys, right? Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely the 09 jersey, but what was it? Maybe yeah. like till 11? I think or... it was like 06 is when it started or something like that. Yeah. Brad yeah. Johnson was the quarterback. And I remember when the billboards came out and it was, uh, Had to be like, you know, like whatever change is coming. And then it was released. And I'm like, what in the hell are these? And at the time they weren't oh. a very good team. So it was like, I think they had just traded Randy Moss and it's like, yeah. this is what yeah. you're trying to do. And because, yeah, Troy Williamson definitely wore them. So, yeah, it was. Uh, um, and then it's just like hideous. That would uh, the billboard that you're referencing would make sense because that would have been 2006. It would have been the onset of the Wilfs, the onset of Childress. Mm -hmm. Peterson was just around the bend, and so uh, it that checks out because it was tremendous change in that era. And Did going from the jerseys that they first like, what having the Viking, the Norseman logo on the sleeve, like you know, and like that stuff, subtle stuff like that, were like were great that was a, a mm -hmm. classic jersey and then the, the especially the the stripe down the pants with the you know the alternating yellow and purple it's like and maybe it's because randy moss is wearing them for all those years it, <laughs> it made it look that much better but uh yeah i'm partial to those interesting i was just gonna say i'm just surprised to hear that you thought they were ugly from the start because i feel like that's 
kind of how it goes. You, it's one of those things you look back at on you, like, cause obviously you guys were wearing the jerseys. I was wearing the jerseys. I didn't mm-hmm. think they were ugly at the time. Neither did I. <laughs> so it's interesting to hear Ron's perspective that he saw the billboard and wanted to drive his car off the road. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's also like, yeah, I, I obviously have one of the jerseys because it's, you know, that's my team. Same with like Timberwolves jerseys. I hate that damn soccer looking thing on the top, but I'll still wear it. It's just you, when you miss the mark on a rebrand, it's like, you know, some teams do it so they they do it right. Like, and if they don't do it right, then they recorrect it. Whereas we were stuck with that that jersey for like our really our best years. Like, we almost had a Super Bowl in those jerseys, and that would have been uh, well as great as it would have been. It would have been like you know, looking back at uniform sets, it's like that wouldn't be the number one that I'd want uh, enshrined in the in the Hall of Fame to see them wearing. So in sports uniforms. Uh, the Vikings horns, like the white horns, the purple he- helmet. Those are like my favorite thing. And I love the NBA. I love the twins in baseball, the tennis. I love tennis. They don't really have uniforms, but uh, so that's how much I love the Vikings horns. But even I would think it'd be cool if you put the Norsemen on the helmet for a game, if you had white helmets and the Norsemen, like just for the hell of it on your Thursday night game or something. But for some reason, uh, the Vikings get really skittish about change with the uniforms. And then the NFL on the whole is only now warming up to, you know, letting the Bengals do their, their white thing. So I hope Sally nailed it. I hope that they allow experimentation with all kinds of different stuff, just like the NBA, just everything the NBA does, every league should copy it. That's, that's how it should go uh, because they, they just know how to do it. All right. I, like that, the want... NFL... oh, sorry, I, was say, I don't think the NFL has any like regulation because the lions have a new helmet, like with their, mm-hmm. like yeah. that logo. And then the, the Colts even have a black helmet, which that's the worst because yeah. there's no black in their logo. Like, so I, 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 and even the Cardinals, they have a black helmet. So, I don't think it's the NFL. I think the NFL would jump at the at the prospects of making any sort of money on any sort of uniform. I think it's pretty uh, owner and uh, team specific on that. All right, fair enough. Ahead, I Sally. was just going to say, does this mean you're advocating for an in season tournament? <laughs> well, the in season <laughs> tournament. Don't get me started. Like that worked out great because <laughs> LeBron and the gang won it. But it it was so funny, and Yannick can vouch for this. I think I messaged him. The NBA season started, like, October, blah, blah, blah. And I swear to God, like, the following Friday, I went to go see who the Lakers play. It was like, the in-season tournament is here. And I was like, we just got started. And, you know, then it was just staggered games. So I I like the idea of it. I think there should be a little bit more meat behind whoever wins it. Like, get as bold as saying whoever wins it, like, you know, gets the first seed in that conference. Uh, Because right now, the incentive, like, they, they all get 500 grand. I guess that's cool. They did a great job, the Lakers and then the NBA, hyping it up and then making it like a big deal. But I think it's going to take a while to get going. So no, uh, NFL tournament. I don't know how. I don't know how that would work. Let's just uh, <laughs> let's get a six-team college football playoff before we uh, okay. we, we do that. <clears throat> All right, sure. let's get to Vikings Lions. We got about eight and a half minutes. Uh, Ron, did, wait, Ron, did you package that? Tell us your favorite uniform and then tell us your expectations for Vikings Lions. Well, I think my favorite are always the throwbacks um, just because I like the, like, well, one, just pay, paying homage to the past, but also like the little tweaks that it seems like I know it, and when Adrian wore the throwbacks, it didn't have that gold striping around the numbers. So like those little subtleties, like I appreciate, like, and so in seeing them in this jersey, I like. Um, so again, like they shit the bed in two of those games wearing them, but uh um, but I think those are the cleanest looking jerseys. And in, in any case, like, yeah, the cream school jerseys in Tampa, when they wore them in the nineties, I thought it was hideous. Yep. The, the Broncos throw, throwbacks that they wear when they wore them back then hideous Seahawks, same thing. Now they wear them and they just look clean. Like even the, I hate everything about Philly, but those, those green, those Heather green jerseys that they wear or whatever, like mm-hmm. it, they're just the, the classics are they just look better. Even the Wolves jerseys that they that they're wearing now. I hated those in ninety five. <laughs> like when they when yeah. they rebranded it, it was great. So uh, it's just something about it when you get away from it long enough and then go back to it. Yeah. Um like who knows, maybe when they bring back those two thousand seven jerseys again, like you know, twenty <laughs> years down the road, maybe it'll look different or maybe it'll have a different feeling. So th- I'm always partial to the throwbacks. So um I'm glad that they don't overdo it and you know wear it for half of the home games, but I like that they mix them in. So um continue doing that. What about Vikings Lions? Give us your expectation. <sighs> I mean the expectations are, you know, it's 
it's hard because I when they play like for the first three quarters that they did on Sunday, like it's they can beat anybody at any given time. But then they have lapses, and then it's again the the question marks surrounding O'Connell and his play calling or his aggressiveness or lack thereof. So it's hard to see that they're gonna come out and take care of business when they have it all in front of them and they have for the last month. Um, I do think that they, that they win uh, because I, I feel like this is, it's a huge pivot point in the season. It's if they lose, like it's no longer in their control. Whereas if they come out and win at home, everything is in front of them. And I think the coaching staff will preach that. Um, and also Jared Goff, um, I saw a stat against Brian Flores defense. Jared Goff is not very good. Um, like, I mean, he had a great game on Sunday. I'm not taking that away from him, but go back the previous couple of weeks. He was not very good against the Bears, wasn't good on Thanksgiving Day against the Packers. So um, you can get – you can rattle Goff. And if you do that early, um, I think the Vikings come out ahead. I see something like a 24-21. It's going to be close because that's what the Vikings give us the last two years is close games. Um, but I see us taking it. I think that the Vikings will win the next two games. I think they're going to look – great uh, against the Lions. They're due for that. For, uh, somehow, Kevin O'Connell has a knack for producing a good game when they need it the most. He's shown that, in my opinion. So I believe that they, you know, they're not going to play completely error-free football with Mullen slinging it, but I do believe this will be one of the good games that will give you a rosy feeling for Christmas heading into New Year's. I come 30-20 to 20, Vikings over Lions. Sally, what you got? I'm actually feeling pretty good about the Vikings this weekend, too. Um, I, the Vikings, we know their fair share of problems, but the Lions are so bipolar still, um, so hot and cold. And Dan Campbell is still making these questionable, risky coaching decisions that I have a feeling will come back and bite him um, this Sunday as well. So I, I'll go 24-20. Yannick, what you got? Vikings, Lions... Christmas Eve. So I think if the Vikings win the turnover battle, they are going to win. If not, they are going to lose, and they have no one else to blame than themselves. Uh, I think it's they're winning 2017. Oh, another squeaker. Always. Of course. Yep. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Sally, what are your Christmas plans? Christmas Eve and Christmas Day? I don't really have any plans. I'm still supposed to be at home, so... Um, I'll just be chilling here, but if anybody out there wants to give me a ticket, maybe I could do a little contest where, you know, someone could retweet me <laughs> a la Rick Sosa and I can be their guest. You must be getting cabin fever. Yeah, I have been getting, I mean, you know, I've been getting a little bored. Yes. I got to leave the house today though. And I, I like I was telling you guys before we started, I feel so much better than I'm supposed to feel. So of course I wanted to just hop in my car and set up the tailgate on Sunday. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to do that, but I'm not going to rule it out for New Year's Eve because it's, it just needs to happen. Especially when we have a seasonable winter so far. I haven't even had to put my I know. sports car in the garage yet or behind on tarped and all that. It's been weird. Well, that's another reason it doesn't feel like we're this close to the end yeah. of the season. <laughs> Ron, because I haven't season? even oh, broke sorry. out the, no, we just haven't even broke out the winter jackets yet for the game. So Ron, your Christmas, Christmas Eve plan. Just small family over, um, you know, I can't wait for all the gifts to be open because I want my living room back. Um, uh, <laughs> like, yeah, it's the kids. Uh, it's fun with the kids at this age, um, you know, four and two where, you know, like they st- all the magic they believe in and everything. And, uh, you know, the elf on the shelf and that fun stuff. Um, so it just, yeah, we'll have our family over and that's about it. Otherwise, just kind of take it easy. And yeah. Hopefully, don't have, don't get sabotaged by a Vikings loss on <laughs> Sunday because that'll that'll really make for a shitty Monday. <laughs> I'm gonna leave you guys with a quick story. Uh, I got two minutes to tell it, <clears throat> and this involves Yannick. So we were leaving Vikings Bengals, depressed, walking out, doing the walk of shame back to the parking garage, and we got back in the car, and my son, who's seven, was with, saying like, "Oh, that sucks that they lost, huh, Dad?" Or he said something to that effect. And I said, yeah, it sure does, man, especially because they could have won. But I told him, I was like, I got you two guys here, and we got two more days left in the city, so we're going to we're gonna have a blast. Who cares that they lost? I said, you know, 
when I was 25 years old, this would have ruined my night and probably my weekend. Like that's how it used to go. And, you know, so I just told him that. And then Yannick said, Yannick, who is 26 years old, said, yeah, back when he was 24, he would have let this ruin his, his, his night and his weekend, but he's not going to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Getting wiser with age, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> All well, right, guys. Yeah, I'm go very ahead. proud of you, Dustin. I'm very proud of you for, for growing. And Yannick, I'm really way. proud of you as well. You evolved much quicker yeah, than the rest of us. Yeah, you by 26. <laughs> yeah. All right. He's well, going to live a long time. We'll do a uh, check on Bryant. Uh, he's supposed to be here, but he was not here tonight. So hopefully he'll be back to talk about this win over the Lions to preview yes. Packer Week. We'll talk to you guys in yes. one week, all right? Okay. Bye. Right. Merry Later. Christmas. Right. Have a good one. Merry Christmas.